this morning, uh, trusting God to be with us, help us, and to pour out His Spirit upon us uh, this morning. I want to start uh, with the hymn, O Magnify the Lord with Me, uh, You People of His Choice, that all the Lord who lendeth breath now in His name rejoice. Uh, thank God we can rejoice today in our great Almighty God. What a privilege to be able to come before Him today and rejoice in His faithfulness and in His everlasting mercy and grace and love uh, toward us. So uh, we want to sing this piece together and magnify the Lord with me.
grace and his mercy. Our Father, we want to thank you today that it is our great privilege to bow together in prayer and to worship you with all of our hearts, even this, your own day. This day that you have set aside for worship, this day, Lord, that you have set aside that we might concentrate upon you and that, O oh God, our focus might be upon you as we come together to worship, as we come together, Lord, to give you praise and to give you thanks. O oh God, make this a precious time, we pray. We pray for the dedication. We ask you, God, that you will bless Clive and Rachel as they have brought their little boy this morning to be dedicated. We pray, O oh God, that you will indeed bless the family. And our Father, we pray that your hand might be upon us even this morning. And then, Lord, later on, as Pastor Samuel opens your word, we pray, Father, that you'll pour your spirit upon him and that your word will be in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of the Lord. So come to us now, we pray. So minister into each and all of our hearts and into each and all of our lives. And we give you the praise. We give you all the honor. And we give you all the glory. We thank Lord that those who cannot be with us this morning, those, Lord, that are elderly, those that are laid aside in sickness, we commend them to you. We pray, O oh God, for Jim Kerr and Mrs. Wright. And we pray for Sir and Barbara Miller, and we ask you, our Father, for your good hand to be upon Jennifer and Sadie as well, that they might know your touch uh, upon them, restoring them more to health and strength. We pray, O oh God, for uh, Trevor Smythe there recovering in hospital uh, from his cancer operation. We ask you, O oh God, for your touch upon him, and we pray, dear Father, that you will be with him and help the Lord in these days, and may he know the touch of God upon his body and upon his soul. Lord, we just look to you and we commend ourselves to you today. We pray for all who are laboring to bring the gospel to other parts of the world. We thank you for Danny and Philippa amongst us and uh, Izzy and Judah and we pray your blessing upon them during this time at home and uh, we thank, O oh God, of others that are out there laboring for you uh, in other parts. Some Lord, uh, training, language training, and uh, getting to grips with a new language, and uh, others, Lord, that are uh, long have long laboured uh, for you on the mission field and are still there, uh, seeking to extend your kingdom. God bless your work. Bless the work of radio ministry and uh, all the other internet ministries as well. We pray, our Father, that indeed that these might be days when many would turn from their sin and turn to the Saviour. So help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a couple of verses of our next hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and uh, we'll just sing the first two verses uh, of this hymn, Turn Your Eyes <coughs> Upon Jesus. We'll just remain and see.
they called him Jesus. And uh, after we sing this piece, uh, Clive and Rachel are going to bring their little boy to, to dedicate it uh, to the Lord. So, uh, him, uh, God sent his son. Verily I 
I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. <coughs> Inasmuch as our Saviour hath said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, this child has been brought, that he may be dedicated to his Maker. As we come this morning to dedicate uh, Clive and Rachel's little <coughs> boy, uh, it's a great joy to be able to bring our children to the Lord and to dedicate them uh, to the Lord and ask God's blessing to rest upon their lives as they grow older. Dedication has nothing to do with their salvation. Uh, they have to come to that point in their lives where they recognize that they're sinners and need Christ as their Savior. And uh, when they come to those years, we trust and pray that they will understand and that they will come and put their trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their own and personal Savior. Just out of this part, I would ask the congregation to please stand. In presenting this child, do you now declare your willingness for the Lord to take possession of him, that he may spend all his life for God, regarding not the, uh, <laughs> regarding not the hardship, want, or sacrifice which true devotion in the service of Christ may demand. Will you, as far as possible, protect this child? from all evil influences likely to injure him in body or in soul and instruct him in the things of God. Thank you. 
a sunlit heart with not a cloud between. Special class 
uh, parenting class, uh, and that will be conducted by Danny and Philippa, uh, training our children in this uh, modern, with modern technology uh, in a sinful society. Uh, there's no other generation has had so much to contend with as the generation now uh, that's growing up so many perplexities and so many difficulties. And uh, Danny will be, and Philippa will be sharing on that. They both taught that uh, out in the, the training college there in Missouri, uh, New Tribes Mission Training College in Missouri, uh, for the uh, young uh, students, couples, and children heading for the mission field. Uh, so that ought to be something that you should make a, an all out attempt to be able to be there. Uh, do please uh, come and be held in the back room at 8 o'clock and uh, if both parents can come, uh, please make that kind of effort if it's possible at all, but at least one uh, come. Then on Tuesday morning will be our Zoom prayer meeting for the mission with John Weir and that will be at 10.30 on Zoom. Wednesday is our prayer meeting and Bible study and uh, that will be again in the back hall and uh, we will have an extended time of prayer uh, on Wednesday night for the mission. There will be a break, but those who can wait on uh, can wait on for a little longer uh, for that time of prayer. Then on Friday is the Life Fighters for the Boys and Girls at 7. Saturday is Quest uh, for uh, the P7s for second, third year age bracket. Uh, so do please uh, remember that. Young folks, do bring your friends along on Saturday evening. And Saturday evening is another uh, special evening because uh, you're going to be getting Filipino food and games. And uh, Danny uh, Brooks is going to be the speaker. Uh, so that's an evening uh, not to be missed. So uh, do please keep that in mind. Then next Sunday, uh, the morning service at 10, 11.30 and the Sunday School and Bible class at 10.40. Uh, the evening service at 6.30 and uh, do please remember these announcements in the will of God. Uh, the Lord bless Pastor Samuel as he comes now and brings us uh, the Lord's word. Chapter 10. 
10, verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. For now they shall say, We have no king. And because we fear not the Lord, what then should a king do to us? They have spoken words swearing falsely and making a covenant, whilst judgment springeth up as the hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the cows of Bethaven, for the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoice on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. It shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to the king Jarhead, and Ephraim shall receive shame. And Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. The high places also of heaven, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us until the hills fall on us. O Israel, thou hast sinned. From the days of Gibeah, there there they stood the battle in Gibeah. Against the children of iniquity did they not overtake them? It is in my desire that I should chastise them, that the people should be gathered against them, when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. And Ephraim is as a heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn, but I pass over upon her fair neck, I will make Ephraim to ride to that shall plow, and Jacob shall break his claws. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ending in verse 12. I'm sure the greatest need in our nation today is not security. It is not a climate change bill or even a new protocol deal. But the greatest need that will solve many issues in our land is a God-sent revival. Not a man-made or a program-generated revival, but a revival straight from God. For much of Britain has, and society has sunk so low, trying to find the meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life. And if we as God's people do not hear this with our ears, and see this with our eyes, then we are not living as close to God as we ought to be. And I believe this morning that Britain is out of control. And like Thomas Jefferson who said about the USA, we say about Ulster, Indeed I tremble for my country. I tremble for my country when I realize that God is just. I tremble for my country when I realize God is just. And I believe with all of my heart, the only way that this nation will rise again will spring forward again if there is a revival takes part, takes place in the hearts of God's own children. A revival from spiritual stagnation, from lifelessness, from backsliding, to a place of personal holiness, to a place of fearful reverence, to diligent prayerfulness, Indeed, whenever God's children are living in the light of God's word, then I believe our prayer beings will feel the wind of heaven blow through them. That Bogashal will feel God conscious. The fear of God will grip the people with an irresistible power. That is the burden on my heart this morning. Hosea is preeminently a book for the backslider. Indeed, Hosea pictures God as a loving husband, yearning for his wayward bright wife, that he might bless her and make her a blessing to Israel. And yet God could say to Israel, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And now Hosea, who is one of the twelve minor prophets out of the Old Testament, they were called minor not because their message was minor, but due to the length of their content, they were minor prophets with a major message. 
And now as we come to this chapter, chapter 10 of Isaiah, let's think about a man, a man who's on his knees, crying to God that God would come and visit his people. That God would come and revive their hearts and turn them from their spiritual idolatries to seek the God of heaven. And he notices, firstly, their condition described, their condition described in verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. The name of Hosea means God has rescued, and indeed God's people needed rescue from their spiraling devotion to God. For following Jeroboam the second successful military campaigns in 2 Kings 14, um, Israel experienced a time of economic uh, growth and freedom. However, as the Israelites' wealth increased, their spiritual devotion to God decreased ultimately leading them to abandon their covenant with God. And so God raised up this man Hosea to call out Israel for the state of their hearts. For the state of their hearts in verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. Hosea is not saying that Israel has, is, is a vine that produces no fruit. But the complaint that God has upon his people is that God's people were fruitful. But that they were selfish. That they had used their fortune to verse 1 to increase, to build their stone altars. They had more wealth and less worship. They had more, um, more sustenance, substance, and less submission. They had used God's own goodness that He had poured into their lives to drown their devotion to God. As a result, they had used God's own resources to build stone altars and idols. And therefore, because they were backslidden, God could say in verse 10, Israel is an empty vine. They had built altars in their heart. I wonder this morning, folk, if we're really honest before God, have you been building altars in your heart? Maybe you're worshipping your family, your money, your career, your wealth, your way of doing things over God. Child of God, do you have altars in your heart? You're worshipping things over a trying God. It's easy to build them up, isn't it? To idolise things over God. And perhaps these things have tore away your devotion to God. And God sees you as an empty vine. You're void of spiritual fruit. There's nothing there. It's just an empty vine. Jesus, he warned of living in such a state when he said, And now also is the axe laid upon the root of the trees in Matthew 3, verse 10. And therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is shewn down and cast into the lake of fire. Folk, if we ever are to experience personal revival, then God must be number one. The altars and idols in our hearts must go. As John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he once said, God must reign without a rival, or he'll not reign at all. God must reign without a rival, or he'll not reign at all. Is there altars in your heart? Hosea calls them out for the state of their hearts in verse 1. They're an empty line. But he also calls them out because they were serving two masters in verse 2. Their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. Now their heart was divided. They worshipped God. Many of these people went to Jerusalem and worshipped the Lord on the feast days. But as soon as they were over, they went back home. And they would build altars to worship Baal. They went one way today and they went a different way tomorrow. They worshipped God on the Sunday, but on the weekdays they were just like the world. I think James, he sums up the condition of that heart in James 1 verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his way. Could it be the reason we are finding so much inconsistency in Christians, perhaps so little blessing, is God's people are trying to serve two masters. Yes, we might sing on Sunday morning, Praise God for whom all blessings flow. But on Monday we act 
like the world. We talk like the world. We speak like the world. And you and I know that we follow whatever has captivated our hearts. If it's God has captivated our hearts, we'll follow Him. If it's the world has captivated our hearts, we will follow Him. And perhaps this morning in your life, Christian, there's a divided allegiance. You're torn between God and the world. And yet Jesus earlier, later on, would say in the New Testament, we cannot serve two masters. For we will love one and hate the other. You'll also know in the book of Joshua, earlier on in the Old Testament, that Joshua had summoned the children of Israel. Because they were, they were serving two masters, they had divided allegiance. And Joshua stood up among them and he pointed the finger and he said, Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. This morning, I, I encourage you, Christian, make up your mind. Decide in this building who will have your worship, who will have your love, who will have your devotion. And know that you would say, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but in name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years to see him. And here's this man called Hosea pointing the finger at God's people and he said, look at the state of your hearts, it's empty. You're trying to serve two masters in verse 2, but also you've lied against God in verse 3 and verse 4. In verse 4, they have spoken words swearing falsely in making a covenant. Their words were worthless. Their words were just sounds that rolled off their tongue. They weren't meaningful and from the heart. They made in verse 4 covenants or valuable promises to each other and to God. But as soon as their backs were turned, they, for the agreements were forgotten and the promises were broken. You couldn't believe a word that they said. They were liars. How many of God's people promises God a new change of lifestyle for the old? How many of God's children weep in the pew and say, God, from this time forward, I am dedicating my life to you. God, you're having it all. I'm placing myself on the altar of God. But as soon as the week begins, promises are broken and agreements forgotten. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 5, Better is it that I shouldest not buy than I shouldest buy and not pay. Friend, be business with God. Let the Spirit of God have his own way in your life. The chorus says, Let the Lord have his way in your heart every day. There's no rest, there's no peace till the Lord has his way. Place your life in his hands, rest secure in his plan. Let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. Personal revival begins. When God has his own way. I remember whenever I used to do some agricultural fencing with my uncle, rolling out this barbed wire across this, we'll call it a shock, but it's like a drain for our American friends. And I remember looking to love the Lord more. And this song, as I was rolling out the barbed wire, this song kept drumming itself into me. Samuel, let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. And I remember as I was rolling out even that wire saying, God, have it all. God, you take Samuel Patterson. And friends, personal revival begins when the Lord has it all. When you give him a blank sheet of paper and you say, God, you write the story of my life. Yet, Israel was unwilling to do that. Verse 4 reminds us, thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Hemlock was a poisonous weed that cannot be stopped. And so, meaning that whenever Israel would plow their fields, that this, this weed would grow up and it would choke everything in it. And people would fear over lack of provision and they would, in verse 5, they would mourn over the calves of fell heaven. They would gather the people together and they would say, we have lack of provision. Who do we turn to? We'll turn to our golden calves in the middle of this desperate state. 
They refuse to turn to the God of heaven. And yet what they do not realize as they kneel down before this calf, that a sign has been placed over them, an echabot. In verse 5, notice it at the end of it, for the glory thereof, because it has departed from it. When the daughter-in-law of Eli the priest heard that the ark of the Lord had been captured by the Philistines, she said, the glory has departed from Israel and called her son Ichabod. The ark represented for Israel God's presence in the midst of them. It is when God's presence or anointing departs from God's people that it can be said that the glory has departed. How sad it is when a believer's life is in such a shambles that God must lift his glory from that person. That it would be hypocritical for God's glory to be there. That his spirit is so grieved that the lifestyle living is such a place that the spirit no longer can find a home there. And the glory thereof is departed. It is a sad day. And it's a terrifying experience to lose the glory of God in your life. To wake up one day and find a sign placed over an Ichabod. The glory of God has departed. And with a broken heart, I believe Uzziah, perhaps with tears in his eyes, looks to Israel and he says in verse 9, O Israel, thou hast sinned. Therein they were coming under the judgment of God. I think Paul, he said that in the book to, his book to Galatia, Galatians in chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap can't beat God. The Greeks had this saying that the, the, the dice of the gods are loaded. Basically meaning that if you gamble with God you'll lose. I don't think you can be a liar and a thief and an adulterer on a Monday and Tuesday and get away with it. God says I've news for you. When you throw the dice of life and you think you're going to come up a winner, when you sow sin you will reap sin. When you sow unrighteousness will reap that lifestyle. So firstly, their condition is described. Now if we left it there, it would be a very bleak and hard sermon, wouldn't it? But secondly, a solution prescribed. A solution prescribed, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. The way the prophets saw the situation was that every, every individual in Israel was a farmer. In fact, if Isaiah was here in the pulpit, he would probably say that each one of you are farmers. That we're sowing seed by our lives. And sadly, Israel had sown very bad seed. And soon they would reap the judgment of God. And yet Isaiah he had a solution that would turn, turn the tide of judgment and he calls God's people to repentance and to reformation for life. A solution prescribed, for it is time to seek the Lord. The period clarified, it is time. Now is the time. Now is all you have. Tomorrow we are not promised. Christian, it is time to seek the Lord for a personal reformation. Unbeliever, it is time to seek the Lord for redemption. The old Mr. Maxwell was praying that this young boy would soon come to an understanding that he was born in sin and that Jesus could be his saviour. And as a child knows right from wrong, that child can become a child of God. And it is our prayer that that will happen. Young boys and girls, you get saved whenever you're this age. You give your life to the Lord now.
before the world impresses his marks on your mind and your ears and your eyes that you see things that you cannot unsee. You trust Christ this morning. You give your life to him. But perhaps you have passed the three score years and ten. You're seventy, perhaps you're four score years in it. And you're now living under a special extension from God. Perhaps you will soon run out of your lease and you'll be ushered out into the judgment seat of God. Dear friends, do not trifle on the verge of eternity. It is time to seek the Lord. This time is all that you have. You're not promised tomorrow. But you're given today. And Isaiah would urge you in chapter 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. And know that you would say, I found this hymn this week and it's really challenged my heart, that some unbeliever would cry this morning, He has called, I cannot tarry. I have heard his voice before. I will leave this deadly sleeping and set open wide the door. In the north blast he rebuked me, and I knew the message well. In the south wind now he whispers, and no longer I'll rebel. Even now again I hear him, come my Lord and enter in. How can I resist thy knocking? Come and cover all my sin. Folks, if you're not saved this morning, don't trifle on the air verge of eternity. It's time, high time, that you were seeking the Lord. Hosea, he moves from a period clarified and urges backsliding Israel to a preparation commended in verse 12. Break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground was once ploughed soil, soil that provided a bumper harvest, but now it had become neglected to the point that the sun had baked it. And the thorns had cluttered it. It was unfit for sowing. It was ground that they had opened up again. It needed turned over. If it was ever to fulfill the role that its creator had wanted it to have, a breaking was necessary. And I trust you see the picture this morning, believer. Your heart might have brought forth fruit of the Spirit. You can look back to a time in your life when you cultivated your heart with spiritual helps. But through neglect and distra distractions, the soul of your heart is fallen. It's cluttered. The Word of God no longer excites you. The prayer meeting is a waste of a honor. Your prayer life is dry, steel. So that whenever the rain of the Spirit tries to revive you, it just runs off your heart. And the question could be asked, was asked to the church in Galatia, you did run well. Who did hinder you? You did so well at the beginning. But what about now? What needs to happen? Hosea says, break up your fallow ground. And folks, if you're in a place of spiritual stagnation, you need to get back to the cross. You need to get back to what Jesus, that Jesus did not die for you, that you might live as you please. But that he died on the cross that you might follow him. Folks, you need to get back to the cross and look to Calvary. That God so loved you that he give us some, not so that you can live whatever way you like, but that you might take up your cross and that you might follow him. That you might not live in shallow spirituality, but that you might live as God intended. Break up your fallow ground. How long are you going to keep that soil hard? Is it not time to open your heart to the Lord? Let him do a fresh work of grace and renewal. The persistence he commanded in verse 12. Seek the Lord 
till he come and bring righteousness upon you. The word translated seek is a little broader than looking or searching. It refers to something that is repeatedly done time and time again. That you perform this action on a continual basis. Let me illustrate as a child, we lived in the country. And uh, our house was, if you imagine it was here, and there was a lane here, and there was a field that separated it. And as kids, uh, to save time, we would just cross this field to get to the lane instead of walking the whole way home around it. And we did so, so many times that we wore an obvious path. We wore the weeds down. We kept going that way time and time again. Until we got there. And likewise, that's what it means to seek. When you seek the Lord for personal revival, it's not a one-time stop. But it's daily seeking the Lord. So that the weeds on that path are gone. So that you've created an obvious path between you and God. So friends, seek Him. For clean hands and a pure heart. For that personal revival. Lastly, the promised certainty is if you are willing to do this, it says that he will come and bring righteousness upon you. God's challenge is for Israel to sow righteousness in their lives, to let God be king, to follow him, and they will receive the reign of righteousness on the nation of Israel. That if God's people follow God with an undivided allegiance, spiritual healing will come. And is that not what we read in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14? That if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Folks, revival must start in the church before it starts in the community. Revival must start in you. If we are to see God's presence come and dwell among us in this mission, it must start with repentance first, and then revival. As I said at the beginning, what we need more than anything else is to see God's power fall on our nation, as it did in many occasions in the life of Israel in the Old Testament church, the New Testament church. What we need in the UK is a mighty manifestation of the glory of God in revival power. But it's really been stirred up in my heart, I believe, by the Lord this week, that the revival must begin among the hearts of God's own people. That there must be a repentance. A repentance, there must be restitution needed. There must be forgiveness needed. Things, wrong things must be made right. And then I believe there will be an holy awareness will come upon our church, upon our community. Well, folks, don't be a hindrance to the Spirit of God. Don't let anything in your life this morning hinder God working in this building. That in this time of vision, the Spirit of God might have free way. That he might see a people whose hearts are right with God. That God might send out, it says that he might reign, not that he might send out a trickle of righteousness, not that he might send out a drop of righteousness, but that God would send out a torrent of righteousness in our land. And folks, this morning, maybe God has touched areas in your life and you say you can relate to Israel. State of my heart, it's empty. If anybody knew it to God, if I really knew it, God knew it, I'd be ashamed. Serving two masters, I have a divided allegiance. I've lied to God about reforming my life, reforming my prayer life, but I haven't. Folks, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time for you to leave this building and put wrong and right with your heavenly Father. And if you're not saved, it's time to seek the Lord for salvation. It's time to ask him into your life. And time to become part of the family of God. Let's stand together as we
sing a very searching hymn, and search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. We often say you can make prayers, you make hymns prayers, but I want you to turn this into a prayer this morning. The Lord, allow the Lord to search you, to know your heart, to know your thoughts, to see if there be any <coughs>
Why do they focus on you alone? In Jesus' name.